Welcome everyone. This is another installation of Dick and Sharon having a conversation with Peter Laufer. Yeah, Peter Laufer was has been a columnist for LA Progressive and he's a, a professor of journalism at the University of Oregon after a long, long, uh, very prominent career as a traveling journalist around the world. Hi, Peter. <laughs> well, good morning. It is morning right now. Who knows what time it is when anybody watches this, but good morning to you, Dick and Sharon. It's a pleasure to be here and to be participatory in the work of the LA Progressive. So one of the things that, that, that has fascinated you that you've done a lot of research is, uh, is on border issues, immigration, uh, especially the US-Mexico border, which is a critical issue uh, that faces us all the time. Would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, why that fascinates you? I, I think that the fascination started with the fact that I'm a first ge generation American. And so I grew up in the climate of immigration, de facto climate of immigration because my father came here from middle Europe. And so that, has always been part of my experience. It uh, it started when he would tell me early in in uh, my life that I shouldn't necessarily be proud of my American citizenship as it relates to me personally because I got it by default. I was born here, whereas he considered his citizenship of greater value because he had to figure out where he wanted to be and work to get here. And, and that's carried me um, throughout life and especially as a journalist, thinking about the, the uh, what, might, what you might call luck versus realities that we create. Of course, it wasn't completely luck. He chose to come here. But, but uh, what does that mean in terms of which side of borders we end up being on and how does that affect our lives? So to your question specifically, I'm a Californian, even though I'm at the University of Oregon now, and and I'm a Northern Californian, unlike you guys stuck down there in the South. <laughs> and um, and and I I grew to realize that the border was with us everywhere. It's not a fact of this line that separates Tijuana and San Diego. The border, the, I think the first time I thought about it as a physical border that reaches north was watching a, a Budweiser guy delivering beer and the carton had the caution notices in Spanish and English, both. Now that's something that's pretty common now where we're basically a bilingual state, but, but that meant five, six, 700 miles north of the border that the border was still in practice, at least in my mind. And I extrapolated that then to the, all 50 states. We, we share this special relationship with Mexico that so often it seems we as a nation and as people try to create this uh, Trump-like wall that they're over there and we're up here. But that's not the case. And, and we see it no matter what kind of physical barrier is erected. So instead, I believe we should be embracing that, that uh, borderlands concept. And I, I like to think I say it without naivete. Yeah, sorry, somebody didn't turn off their phone. That's, I can cut that out. Do you, do you have a question, honey? Yes, I do. I have a question. So thank you, Peter, for sharing that information about your dad. Um, so you come to us um, having a sense of immigration and what borders mean, because you're seeing through the lens of a first generation American, having a parent uh, migrate or immigrate here uh, from Europe. Uh, do you mind telling us which country in Europe? No, not at all. And it's, it's Hungary, which uh, my father certainly saw that, um, that unfortunate future for Hungary that continues to this day, where Orban is uh, running it like, or trying to, his fiefdom, and is uh, creating all sorts of anti-democratic and repressive realities on the ground there. So when I look 
back at Hungary, at his Hungary, and at the contemporary Hungary of my cousins. We we travel there periodically and visit family. It's um, it's a reminder of how lucky we are to be on this side of the Atlantic. So that gives us uh, another shade, another view into your perspective. I thought it was interesting that when you talked, when you spoke of the border, you mentioned the Mexican border. Of course, there's another border that we also share uh, with Canada. And um, oftentimes when we talk about issues associated with immigration, we generally look to the South of us um, when we talk about issues, struggles, problems, but we don't look at it that way when we look at our relationship with Canada. Do you have a sense why? Well, I not only have a sense why, and uh, it's uh, it, it's um, predominantly white to the north, and it's predominantly not white to the south. But before we even get to that, um, well, I should be responsive to your question. I I always rely on a on a uh, Mexican comedian in response to this reality and in his in his act he he says they like our food they like our music they like our costume they like coming down to our beaches they just don't like us uh, and and uh, that's funny but it's that kind of humor that is so based on reality it's impossible to suggest that there isn't a race component to the, um, the welcome that we extend to Canadians and the wall that we build to separate us from Mexico. So to that end, I've thought about this a lot and I have a very quick and easy solution that'll never happen. And that is this, that we have a special relationship to, to Mexico, of course. We are sitting in California, which was part of Mexico until the War of Conquest that President Polk decided to wage and, and half of Mexico became America, the United States of America, generically speaking, America. So Canadians can come down here anytime they want. They can come down here and go to Disneyland next door to you guys. They can come down here and go to school. They can get visas relatively easily to work if they want to work down here. Uh, they can they can travel back and forth across the border to shop, no problem. And and uh, the solution is, in my not so humble opinion, that we just extend the same relationship to Mexican nationals. Now, there's a greater border problem on the South, particularly, but to some extent on the Canadian border too. And that is people what that the Border Patrol refer to as OTMs, other than Mexicans that it, it's uh, always intriguing to learn the jargon. And, and, uh, and, and there are problems that need to be addressed. We can't probably open up this country to everybody who wants to come here, but we do have a special relationship with Canada and we do have a special relationship with Mexico because we share the border. So how about instead of all of this massive technology and, and police power, being exerted to keep people out, that we just give it a try and have the same policy for Mexicans as we have for Canadians. And then all of that technology and police power can be directed at keeping those that arguably we don't want in here out, whomever they may be, or at least controlling better the migration of other than Mexican citizens coming north. The reality is that we, we historically want and need these people up here as workers, as relatives, as friends, as customers. The list is endless. The historical relationship that binds us and transcends the race issue that you mentioned to Mexico and Mexicans. It sounds, uh, as I say it, so um, obvious, and yet I have been chastised for, for offering it as something simplistic and unworkable. Yeah, talking about solutions, we have, we as Americans and our political leaders have several big issues 
that all we do is kick down the can. We talk forever about Medicare for all, Obamacare, and yet decade after decade, we still have millions of people without adequate health care. We have 60,000 houseless people on the streets of Los Angeles year after year, and now decade after decade, we have offered solutions and nothing really changes. And immigration is another one. I mean, it's always in the political discussion, and yet we don't seem to be willing to, to give and take and come up with a solution. Do you think we ever will? Well, it's so easy to politicize. If you, if you remember, and unfortunately, I'm sure you do, Trump coming down that escalator and assaulting Mexicans en masse conceptually as evil and the Americans on the north side of the border as victims, that, that is so easy. And it was so successful in his case, and it's successful in others too. So if if uh, if I can't I can't not be optimistic, but this divisiveness that we are seemingly entrapped by, the border is one of the most divisive uh, issues on the on the table. What's fascinating to me especially after spending time in the borderlands on both sides of the border, is, is that the people who live immediately on the border and on the north side of the border, especially perhaps, are, are cognizant of the value of traffic back and forth. And, and, the, and the people who are waving their fists and their Trump flags and saying, build the wall, build the wall, are in Kansas and Minnesota or New Hampshire or wherever. Now, of course, the border extends up there because workers are needed up there and people travel up there for any number of other reasons, as we've already discussed. But the people who live this day in and day out are aware of how counterproductive this is. So uh, I want to get back to the centrality of race because you talked about President Polk and the very um, different way that our border expanded um, the territory that where Dick and I currently live, which was, was the original home of the Tongva people, the indigenous people that lived here, but it was also part of Mexico. And initially the United States, um, their attempt to expand was based on the notion that they could expand slavery. And of course that blew up in their faces. Um, they weren't able to expand slavery, but they did actually take over land that did not belong to them. And I don't believe that we did that in Canada. And I do believe that when we talk about a physical manifestation of an ideology that the borders themselves give us a clear picture as to what, it, what are the thought processes of the leaders. So the leadership, if I was to look at the way that the borders have expanded for the United States, I would say that the leaders felt that they had the supreme right to just go and take over another nation, another sovereign nation's area, and they felt right, that was right for them to do so. And I believe that until this country has a clear understanding of where the sense of entitlement comes from, white superiority, where does this come from? We'll continue to do this. So as we're simply seeing a manifestation of white uh, supremacy, and I know you must be asking, well, where's the question? If you can expand upon that. Yeah, well, there are a couple of things come to mind and we could talk about this forever. Uh, obviously, manifest destiny by its definition fits into exactly what you're saying. Manifest destiny was a justification for theft and and settlement, and that it, that it is celebrated, or at least it was when I went to grammar school. One can hope it's not any longer, but I even remember in that period of my own personal growth, looking at a, a map of North America and thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could take over Canada, we the United States? It, it, it was so embedded in, in uh, the, the way, at least I interpreted what I was being taught. But when I moved, I'm going back and forth between California and Oregon now. And when I moved up to Lane County, which is where the University of Oregon main campus is, 
I, I learned that Joseph Lane, for whom the county is named, uh, it has a sordid, sordid history in the context of what you're talking about. And during the period when the Oregon Territory was making its moves to become a state, there, there was, as you may well know, and those who are listening and watching may well know, in the Oregon Territorial Constitution, uh, forbidden as residents were what was called in the Constitution's language, mulattoes and Negroes. And when the state became a state, that language moved into the state constitution where it resided, even though it was then illegal until 1927, when it was finally removed. But where Joseph Lane falls into this is that he opposed, he was, uh, he became a, um, one of the first senators for Oregon, and he opposed statehood initially. And the, and the, I, I'm pretty sure I've got this right. So if there's some Oregon scholars there and I'm missing some titles and putting names in the wrong places, conceptually, this is correct. Those who opposed slavery, uh, those who opposed statehood, opposed statehood because they feared that Oregon would come into the union as a slave state. And they were so intent on keeping the populace white that they didn't even want it to be a slave state because that would mean that black people would be moving into Oregon theoretically or potentially en masse. So yes, to your, your concerns that uh, at least there seems to be some growing awareness of the, uh, the, the, the racist foundation of our country is very hard to transcend. So, so uh, you mentioned that Mexican immigrants are, are found in Kansas and Minnesota as well. And I'd like to point out some of our hypocrisy. I'm from Minnesota and, and I've got, I know that there are Mexican immigrants there, uh, uh, probably a lot more than when I, when I lived there as a kid. But, uh, but my guess is they didn't come there for the food, I guess. They probably didn't come for the beaches on Lake Superior or the culture. They came there for the jobs. And for the meatpacking industry, probably. Precisely. I was going to point to that because my dad's family comes from nearby, near Austin, where one of the big meatpacking plants was. And when I was a kid, I knew some young men my age who got jobs there, young white Minnesota men. And they were well-paid jobs. It's kind of grisly work. But these are farm kids, and they're accustomed to dealing with animals, and it's good jobs. And now those places are, are, are filled with... Mexican, un, typically undocumented Mexicans, undocumented on purpose so that they can't really complain much. They certainly can't unionize. And, and if, if they're fired, they have no recourse. Um, so, so why do we always bl uh, point our fingers at the undocumented as they're the bad people and not the corporations and companies and agriculture, the big farmers, who, who want, who need that cheap labor, cheap controllable labor. I mean- uh, it, It's always a, a mystery how little enforcement is directed at the employers and their various devices that are used by employers in order to insulate themselves, such as getting the employees from a contractor. So they are working with a contractor who's supposed to vet the employees. But our laws also work in a, in a manner that can be counterproductive for the employees. The, the H-1B visa, which allows a worker to come north for a period of time, such as the harvest period, and then return to Mexico, those visas are with one employer. So that same kind of dynamic potentially exists that you described, Dick, where the, the, it's not, there's not a balanced relationship and the employer can exert a, even a unstated control because if the employee is fired or does not wish to continue to be in that environment, she or he can't just go across the street to the next farm or the next factory or the next meatpacking plant. And, and, um, and yet 
uh, as you say, and as I say, and as I think at this point, most people in this country must understand, we need these workers. And in one of the books I've written on this subject, highlighted was a tobacco farmer in, in Kentucky. And he, he was involved in bringing workers up on the H-1B visa. And he was a, a special guy. He and his wife would travel down to the towns and villages where the workers came from in Mexico so they could see where their workers lived the rest of the year and how the money was spent that they earned on the tobacco farm. But one, one of the things that he said in his vernacular, he said, he said, I've tried to hire, hire local whiteies, but um, uh, they can't drive a manual transmission. They can tell you the scores of all the basketball games going back 10 years, but they can't shift the gears of my truck. Oh. And, and so the, that kind of a reality that that uh, that the on the ground um, reality in some ways gives me hope that this uh, institutionalized racism that we've been talking about we can perhaps eventually grow out of. I certainly hope that's true. I I, I really do hope that's true, Peter. Well, I mean, I, I think it's possible. I I be, but I don't think it's possible unless there is an intent to do so. I don't think that it's going to sort of happen by osmosis. I think that we have had 400 years of an intentional, deeply entrenched racist um, ideology that has shaped this country. And we have to use the same intention to undo what has been done for so many years. Yeah, there's no question. And on the border, that's that can be seen with these vigilante groups that decide it's their job to help the border patrol. And, and there is so much racism inherent in the motivation of these groups. I am not just speculating, I spent time with them and, and uh, the, the desire is to keep Mexicans out of this country. And of course, there is the reality that somebody jumping the fence is doing something that is illegal but when, when, as you point out, Dick, the, there's such invitation, here's the job, we want you. And, and as you point out, Sharon, there's uh, such racism in the imbalance of the relations, relationships. Uh, we, have, we, we can't fool ourselves. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. So I had one, my final question. When, when you visited us, a, a lovely visit, you were, you were on a project to update a book you'd done on classical neon signs. And I wondered uh, what was what going on with that. There we go. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this, this, uh, um, since we're so, since we're so um, uh, high and mighty about everything we're talking about because we are we we know what's right and what's wrong isn't this the sexist picture but sure isn't it, it, i was just thinking of oh how objectifying that is <laughs> yes but isn't it also lovely in its own way and yeah. it no longer exists and if you look carefully you can see the stained curtains behind her ah. it it was a saloon in elko and um and yes it speaks of a time it's from the 40s you can tell from her hairstyle and uh, it, what what are the messages? But nonetheless, it it is an example of how the neon sign has influenced the development of Nevada culture, and by extension, cultures everywhere. And my wife and I have been working on this project for quite some time. And the University of Nevada Press will be publishing the book a year from now. We're just finishing writing, and we just made and are in the process of continuing to make. Uh, trips up to Nevada to update the the work. So it so unfortunately a plane uh, flew over just as you were describing. Could you tell us the the nature of the book? So this is a, a compilation of photographs. Well, we have been we have been uh, documenting neon signs across Nevada, looking at the influence of the neon sign on the development of the Nevada culture and by extrapolation cultures elsewhere and neon. Uh, experienced a decline when the backlit 
plastic signs that are less expensive to maintain and less vulnerable to weather became popular, but there has been a resurgence, a renaissance of neon, both because of its value for advertising, the way it, uh, it draw, its movement tends to draw attention, but also as a recognition of the, the um, emotion that, that uh, can be, at least for some of us, um, triggered by, by the magic of the flicker, of the, of the glow, and of the brilliant colors, and the artistry of the tube benders, as they call themselves, who, who bring this to life. So this, uh, this final edition of the book is being published by the University of Nevada Press next year at this time. Great. Well, Peter, it's been a delight having uh, this brief discussion with you. We look forward to more, particularly after the book is published. Um, maybe you'll share with us some of the images that are in the book, and we certainly want to encourage people to buy it when it's available after it's been published. Dick, is there anything else you'd like to well, say? Well, we certainly want to encourage you to uh, submit new articles on any topic that you want if you are so motivated, and we deeply thank, thank you for sitting still for this time. Well, it's great to talk with you as it was when you were so gracious to welcome me to your home, Dick and Sharon. Thank you. And and uh, continue the fine work of the LA Progressive because we need your voices and the voices you bring to the Progressive. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So long. Bye.